Welcome to The People Show with Bick Nazar and Randy Janda. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to The People's Show. On a Wednesday, Vic Nazar, Randy Janda, Jamie Dodd here, fresh off of the Canucks Hour. Joel Goddett running the show. And you, 65650, into the Dunbar Lumber text message inbox, the smart alternative. Visit Dunbar Lumber on Bridge Street in Ladner or Arbutus in Vancouver online at Dunbar Lumber. Dot com. Lots to get into throughout the course of the day. You'd think, hey, a couple of days off. Maybe we'll have a chill day. Not the case. No, that doesn't happen in Canada when it comes to hockey, but especially with a team that is, what, hovering? Is kind of, I don't even know. Treading water? Treading water, hovering around the, I wouldn't even say the playoff line. They're, you know, based on what happened last night, they've, they've sunk a little bit, Vic. It was not a good night. In terms of homework night. Uh, do you want to detail all the losses that happened? Or, or all the uh, the wins, actually, but losses for the Vancouver Canucks that happened uh, last night. Because uh, it was uh, pretty pretty rough last night. Uh, so, across the NHL, the Oilers, the Flames, the Jets, the Knights, the Ducks, all won yesterday. Which puts uh, Vancouver... You know, we were talking about, hey, leapfrogging teams, and you're, you're starting to do that whole process, and they get to, what was it, 10th in the Western Conference. Now they are in 12th as far as points pace, and uh, that uh, paints a very different picture than where we were 48 hours ago getting ready for the New Jersey Devils uh, to now where things are a lot uh, tougher. Yeah, we're no longer just lamenting the goal differential, the, uh, the plus one that was. Uh, now you're looking at also... You know, what happened with the standings. And hey, this is going to be the the rule of the day. This is going to be the conversation until the trade deadline and beyond for that matter of, of the 27 games you have left, how many do you have to win? And you're going to need some help as well. So what is that magic number? Like 17, 18? You got to take care of your business, but at the same time, you have to look at the scoreboard. When we talk about players wanting to make the playoffs, when you're the coach talking about the playoffs, that's what you're dealing with, Vic. It's going to be a tough, tough fight if that is even possible. For sure. Like, a, a tough fight is, to, to, to put it lightly, right? And you're not quite at the stage yet where you have to look at other teams and, and you require help, but it certainly, if it comes your way, you take it in stride. Again, in theory, they could win a lot of games and get to 95 points and handle it themselves, but r- reality is... Uh, you're going to pick up a couple of L's along the way, and at some point or another, you're going to have to look at, hey, what did Edmonton do last night? What is Anaheim doing tonight? What is Winnipeg up to? What is Dallas doing? And if if they pick up W's, it's just going to make life tougher for you. And that's why the trade conversation is something that you're going to hear a lot more of, because as this goes on and as those teams start to pick up points and maybe you're going to drop a couple here and there, guess what? That conversation, it's only getting louder from here. Till March 21st. And part of that conversation, uh, if you opened up 32 Thoughts today, the blog, which if you have not, always encourage, uh, check but out What LA. are you doing? Yeah. First y- of all. Y- y- honestly, you're not really a hockey fan if you're not reading 32 Thoughts uh, from Elliot Friedman. There's nothing like it in the hockey world. So go to sportsnet.ca and check it out. Lots of interesting stuff uh, across the whole league, but for Vancouver Canucks related thoughts, Number 14, I believe it was the thought. Vancouver players are sick of the rumors. And Elliot opines, not that I blame them. And they've made it very clear. They're sick of the trade rumors. And look, it's been going on for some time. And to be honest, I am very sympathetic to families of players. And I understand it can be challenging. But when you read it in writing like that, that they're sick of rumors, I got to admit, Canucks fans, that should be worrying. Because the fundamental relationship teams, and in particular players, have with fans and the cities, 
is rooted in winning. That's what this is all about. That's why we come on the airwaves. We talk about how can this team improve to win, whether we're right or wrong. That's why you call into these shows. That's why you buy jerseys. That's why you go to games. Everything is rooted in winning. Community aspect is important, but everything comes down to winning. This team hasn't done any winning. I know recently, look, eighth best since Boudreaux arrived in the calendar year, they're 11, 8, and 3, right? They got the coach bump. And then when things rarely started to get back into the grind of a season, the last 22 games, they've been 11, 8, and 3. Is that remarkable to say, hey, you you maintain your spot on the team? That's okay. And look, that's just a 22-game sample. Mm-hmm. Go back a couple of years. S- span this out a bit. They're 24th in points percentage. You can't sit here and talk about Oh, we're trying to raise the standards and change the habits of our organization. And then when you don't provide those standards, say, whoa, 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 whoa. Why is everyone talking about shipping us out of town? You can't have it both ways. And if if you're reading that and saying, hey, we're, we're weeks away from the trade deadline. And guess what? We're sick of the rumors. What are you talking about? I don't, I don't, it, it comes from a place of such entitlement, to be honest. To not understand the relationship with this, like what this entire universe around winning hockey games means. I would be really worried reading that. Okay, if you're a player, and I'm not saying this is the right way to think about it, but this is from what I understand. If you're a player, you look at the day-to-day results. We make fun of that quote from Jim Benning, but that's a player's mindset. And I think in their minds, some of their minds, and I can't speak for all of them, but I'm I'm trying to put my, my kind of mind in that situation. You're saying, hey, we're playing well under Boudreaux. But in the short term, you're looking at it as a as a short term issue. You're saying, "Hey, we're doing pretty good outside of these stinkers that we had against, you know, the New Jersey Devils." But this is a big picture topic. It is a big picture topic in the sense that this market is sick of the day to day. You talk about building a winner. That's what it comes down to. So, as a player, I can understand that frustration when you hear about something about where somebody works. I don't care what your profession is, about moving their family, job security, whatever. It sucks. But in this case, it's the game. And in this city, it's going to be conversation based on the fact that everybody in this market, a fan that has been riding with this team since they came into the league, is one focus. It's not playing meaningful games in March, folks. It's not playing meaningful way, games it's, in April. It's, it's, it's now March. Uh, which is congratulations yeah. to those that care about meaningful games in March. It's about building a winner. So from a player's perspective, I get it. But this market is looking at it completely differently. So when you hear your name pop up, you know, we talk about regime change. And there's a lot of calls in this market for regime change. You know what happens in regime change? Players at the executive, or sorry, individuals at the executive level are let go, which we saw with Benning and Wisebrod and, you know, Chris Gear, Jonathan Wall. Go through the individuals. New people were brought in. That also happens at the player level. So while they may be sick of hearing it, This is what regime change looks like. You're going to have a lot of discussion. You're going to have a lot of chatter because the ultimate goal should be winning the ultimate prize. And that hasn't happened in this city. So if the standard is something that is, hey, beyond the day-to-day, I'm okay with that. I welcome that based on the fact that this organization's never won the damn thing. And it's It's a big problem. Rager's texting in. Vic, why are you so mad? I would ask, why are you so content missing the playoffs all the time? And if, if the players are content with that and say, hey, look, we missed the playoffs, but don't get rid of us. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And we got the GM saying practice habits have to change. We have the, 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 the coach talking about new standards have to be put into place. All of this leads to the big word, culture. Yeah. And then we're hearing, oh, players are sick of hearing the trade rumors. Okay, where we differ, though, is that – on a player, if I hear a player say that, or if I hear that sort of conversation coming from players, like that doesn't shock me because the player is a day to day individual. They're not looking long term. Mm-hmm. They're looking at their results. They're looking at their goals. They're looking at the W's. They're looking at that. So if you are hearing that from a player, it doesn't shock me whatsoever. I think as a fan base, as individuals that cover this team, we see it differently. But a player looks at it unless you are a lifer in this organization. Right? Like, Henrik and Daniel Sedin probably look at it differently, maybe, than they did playing the day-to-day. 
you have a bigger worldview of it. I don't get necessarily ticked off when I see that because I expect players to say that. They're just saying, hey, man, we're creatures of habit. I don't like being uncomfortable. That's essentially what they're saying. I don't like being uncomfortable. And again, the point here, I'm going to read Elliot's thought again. Vancouver's players are sick of the rumors. They've made it very clear. Shouldn't fans make it very clear that they demand winning? Again, 11-8-3 in this calendar year. Is is that the bar that you're comfortable with? And 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 now this is the thing that you say, hey, we've made it very clear. We 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 are sick of the rumors. Yeah. And again, big picture, it's like, well, they went to the bubble. They they had success there. And you look at it. There's only eight players from that team that are on this team. It's Demko, Hughes, Pedersen, Miller, Horvat, Besser, Mott, Pearson. That's it. So this this long four year spell. Those are the only guys that are around here. This finishing 24th over the past four years, that standard is carried on by those eight players. And if you're sick of hearing rumors, win games. Like, it, if if you can't understand that point, that your relationship to the city is directly as a result of how you perform, and you're, you're confused of... Trade rumors. I I don't know what to tell you. This is about winning, and they haven't won enough in the, over the over the course of a couple of years here. No, and it's a like, goal. Oh, they went to the bubble. They won a round. They won one round. Like that's keeping you warm at night over the course of the ten years. Well, okay, here? but a lot of those players weren't even here. This is to me like it's it's just the uncomfortable aspect where when you're in a Canadian market, you're going to be a part of that discussion. And your point is right. If you're not winning, if you're not picking up points, if you are not, and I'm not talking about the short term here, I'm talking about the long term. If you are not a contender, which is something that this organization should be, should strive to be, and from everything we hear, that's the ultimate aim. Is in maybe a couple of years time they build towards that. But as a player, you may or may not be a part of that conversation. You or may may not be a part of that team, and we don't know. Ultimately, what Jim Rutherford's going to do at this trade deadline or in the offseason. But the fact of the matter is, they don't want to hear it because there's, there's, you know, it's not something you can predict. And I, I get that. But that's playing in Canada, Vic. You go to Montreal, you hear the rumors in two languages, right? That famous quote from, from Brian Burke, he said it a little differently than I did. You go to other markets, Toronto, sure, same thing. This is the reality of when you do not produce at a high level, and yes, history is a part of this. Some of these players were not on those teams. But it is the reality of playing Canada and the whole aspect of it. Like, let's go back this, back on this a little bit. It's the game. This is the game you choose as a professional athlete all the time. So I get it. That's and- the thing I don't get is like a lot of athletes understand that. Brendan and I was texting in. The players should understand the fans' perspective over the last four years. If, if, if you don't want to be traded, let's see some wins. And it's not just about four years. This is a longer stemming thing, obviously, 50-plus years. But they are the ones that are being ushered with the responsibility to try to get wins now. And when you don't, these are the consequences. And I, I use that term lightly, consequences, because yep. you're still getting an NHL contract if you get traded. You're still making your money. And again, you want to win here. You want to do it in Vancouver. Great city to live in. I wouldn't want to leave Vancouver anyways. I came back to the city after working in another couple of markets. It's a great city to live in. And I understand it. It's tough on families. It's tough on kids in the families. I get it. Your responsibility is towards winning. And I used that E word earlier, entitled. And you can also use another word, like comfortable. And we talked to Yannick Hansen yesterday. And I read him the quote from Patrick Alvey. And just asked him, like, what are your thoughts when you hear something like that? And it, it comes to, like, a lack of competition. Here's what Yannick had to say yesterday. It's a little bit of a warning. And it is, again, I think it's what we've been talking to as well, like the, the safety of your spot on this team. Uh, I don't feel like there's any players on this team who doesn't feel like uh, their spot is 100% guaranteed. There's nobody pushing behind them or saying, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this spot. But there's nobody coming from... From the minors, uh, you're not worried about getting sent down. It, it is a little bit of a warning, um, and there has been not too much competition from within for, for spots. 
the competition that comes when we're signing these free agencies, um, we're trading for players. Um, it's not a whole lot that that's coming from, in this case, Abbotsford, where, again, going back to my days, I, I felt like we were a handful, if, if not seven or eight guys in Winnipeg who could, on any given night, depending on who went down or how players were playing, could get that call up. What we're right now is like, oh, it's we go three or two or three injuries deep. We're gonna have to call up a guy, and it's 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 the same guy who comes up. It doesn't matter what kind of guy goes down. So that depth that they're also talking about, that they're wanting to create competition for spots, that hunger, the urgency, the the the, the fear of not playing in the NHL. I don't see it, um, but but it's not a it's not just in Vancouver's case. It's in a lot of the other cities and and teams as well because of how the league has evolved. You don't have time for for seasoning these young guys. They get thrown in and hope they can hope they can swim right off the bat. So again, it's it's a new world in in terms of how the NHL works from when I played. And maybe that's also why it's hard for me to to relate to to some of these things. And I'm saying, okay, well, back in the days, this was how it was, should be done. And I'm sure that when I played, guys that were out at that point look back and say, well, when I played, it was like this as well. But again, when when things aren't working or going the way you want to, maybe you're looking for for solutions. And again, you go back to the last time things worked. Well, that was when we played, and it was a different different scenarios. It's Yannick Hansen. If you want to go listen to that entire conversation, which we always recommend you go do, hour two of yesterday's People Show podcast on Spotify, Google, or Apple, wherever you grab your podcast. And yeah, that lack of competition. Maybe it's set in a certain, you know, mentality. It's like, hey, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable. I I, I can be complacent a little bit because there is a lack of competition. There there aren't a lot of players coming up trying to snipe more opportunities. And a lot of these players have been the you know, core members, that that core of eight I mentioned there. They were there in the bubble. They're still here now. And fans haven't gotten their wins. And I, I, I was stunned to see that today in, in 32 Thoughts. Again, I'll read the quote again. Yeah. Vancouver players are sick of the rumors. They've made it very clear. Let's go back to when Pittsburgh was not having success prior to 2015. Do you remember when Evgeny Malkin's name was being floated out there? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure it bothered him as well. But when you set a standard for yourself, and it feels like you hit a dead end, there is going to be chatter. There is going to be discussion. And the reality is, and from this is from you know what the insiders have said, that the market has been gauged on some players. Whether they feel like they want to trade them or not, they want to know what the price is. They want to know what's going on on the market. And that happens. And that happens with players that have won at the highest level, right? I just mentioned Evgeny Malkin. There was even discussion maybe a few years ago about Patrick Kane. Did it turn into anything? No, it didn't. Alexander Ovechkin was even rumored way back when, when they couldn't win a Stanley Cup. So those are individuals that have had results. This organization, this team, hasn't. So if those trade rumors... And listen, we're not in the business of making up. We're, we're, and we're, we're of the business of reacting and, and reporting what we hear from some of the best insiders of the game. Let right? me be unequivocal about this. And I think you might agree with me on this. And we, we've talked about this the past 10 days. Yeah. I think the, the activity at the trade deadline is going to be a lot less than people think. I know Miller's name's out there, Besser's name's out there, and all this sort of stuff. I, I think over under, one and a half trades. I'll take the under. Tyler Mott, probably. Yeah. Yep. And so, again, I, I, I don't think a lot will happen, but this idea that your name is in the rumor mill, and that's frustrating. You haven't won. Bick, we're talking about a retool. A retool is being suggested. What happens in a retool? What happens when you're trying to change culture? What happens when teams are expected to make changes? Players move. And co- consideration, conversation on that factor, on, on that note, is going to be expected. They did that in Boston. They did that in a bunch of other markets where things felt like they were getting stale. And earlier this year, the first 25 games of the year, like, I don't know if a lot of people have forgotten about that. I haven't. So what is this team? Is this team the team that we see, you know, put up seven goals on the Calgary Flames? Or are they that team that play against the New Jersey Devils? So as far as I'm concerned, it's all fair based on the fact that nothing has happened that can you can emphatically say that this team 
is doesn't need a retool. A retool means you're you're moving things around. You're shipping people out potentially. Brandon and Langley texts in. He says, do the players think owners brought in the most trade active GM in recent memory to not look at moving players to improve the team? That was the sole purpose they brought in Rutherford and Patrick Alvin. This was not minor cosmetic changes to the Canucks organization. This was a massive shift in direction by ownership saying, you know what? The route we were on for the last seven or eight years, that was wrong. We need a high, high-level executive like Jim Rutherford with a level of cachet and with a willingness to make, make bold moves to come in and put us on a new direction. You can't get on a new direction with the exact same players. There, there's going to be roster turnover, and guess what? It's the trade deadline, so there's going to be speculation. There's going to be reports about what this front office wants to do. I'm not sure why anyone should be surprised by all of this. It's evident from the, the, the decisions that this franchise has made that they're going to look at trading players. It's it's a great shout by Brendan and Langley uh, coming in with that text. And also, again, if you just want to look at the smaller sample size, their last three losses are to non-playoff teams with six, seven, and seven goals against. That's troubling. Yeah. That's that's how things like rumors get started. It's like, whoa, maybe we don't have the team we thought we did because we're getting lit up by non-playoff teams. And again, I just go back to the fundamental relationship between fans and the players and its city. When you don't provide the W's, what, like what what exactly do you expect? And and that's the thing. It's like if you don't understand that, what else don't you understand? No, and I'm I'm of the opinion that you know a couple of years ago when the Brock Besser conversation came out and and okay, is he going to get traded and all that? I wasn't a huge com- fan of that because that I think the team was doing relatively well. They're near a playoff position. He was still what 23 years old at that time. Didn't make sense to me at that point. Now you fast forward a couple of years. And you haven't been able to get anything done from a team perspective outside of the bubble experience. I think everything is fair game. Everything needs to be discussed. We've talked about the touch untouchables at length, but as far as you know, winning, it, this city hasn't seen it. I love the Scott Road Sellies folks, but that was a small sample size of what winning should look like, especially for this starved market that hasn't seen it. That was a start. That that's not a cop win. That's a small level of success. Uh, we got this text here, uh, unsigned. It's not just the reality of playing in Canada, Randy. How about Chicago, Boston, New York? Those fans are critical of their players as well. It goes on to say that it's uh, harsh. Uh, the narrative of Canadian fans being harsh on players, that's what def- deters them from wanting to play in Canada. So stop with that narrative. Okay, those markets that the texture did mention, you know what they have? Other major sports teams that also deflect a bit of the attention. In Vancouver, we don't have that. With all due respect to the Whitecaps and Lions, this is hockey all the time. We talked baseball for 45 seconds yesterday, and people wanted us to shut up about that. So that's what makes Vancouver different. Vancouver is different than those other market bases or those fan bases because it's hockey all the time. Even Toronto doesn't have that. Steven East Van Texan, talk about entitled. Bix take is such a local media entitlement take. Of course they're sick of the rumors because they're just that. Rumors media driven, The me, sorry, media drives the rumors and the players have to deal with them emotionally, talk to spouses, kids, etc. And for no good reason, outside of local talk radio needs content. Legitimate trade talk is fair, but rumors and speculation by media is so tone deaf It's baffling as a fan and listener. Bick is stunned. Tell me how many rumors come from legit discussions. Not many, and your stunned players are tired of it. Think of the anxiety and mental health of the players. Of course, trades are part of the game, but media are stunned. It's outrageous. That is Steve in East Van. Again, this is part of the game. That's part of the game. If they were winning, do you think anyone's talking about get rid of these guys? Yeah. Get rid of these guys. That doesn't happen. No, no, it doesn't. You win, everyone celebrates you. You lose, people look for solutions. And part of the solutions is free agency, draft, trades. Okay, in the one sense, I'm not stunned, though, because with hockey players, they do kind of live in their own bubbles, right? Like, it, they're making millions of dollars, and they that, to me, is... I'm not stunned by this because, yeah, it does affect them because they, they play within the team, they look the day-to-day. So that doesn't surprise me. Um... Okay, on this note, and I'll be 100% honest, if there's a few professions that kind of relate to athletes, it's actually media. We hear chatter about us. Every day! We we hear chatter about us getting fired 
every single day, folks. So if there's any sort of actually, you know, our paychecks checks don't relate. I can guarantee you that much. But if there's anything that we can maybe even relate to a little bit, it's this. We get this every single day. So I, I get it, Steve. Thank you for the text. That's a It's a good conversation. But um, that sort of thing, I understand it because there are other professions that go through that as well. Bick Nazar and Randy Chanda here in the People Show. Keep the interaction coming, 650 uh, We'll also have plenty of opportunities for you to chime in, 604-280-0650, uh, for you to grab a line, talk to us, argue with us, agree with us, whatever you want to do, uh, you can do so. But we'll chat with uh, Mike McKenna. Sorry, I was going to say, ahead. Bick is stunned I'm not, though. That, that's the. I think we're on the same page. But I'm not stunned. No, no. Well, sorry. I, I, I'm stunned at what I read earlier in 32 Thoughts. Okay. I'm not stunned at the reaction. Okay, okay. I'm not even stunned at the players. Players, man, come on. They're they're millionaires. I, I understand it's frustrating. But, like, why would you go public with it? Why why is the quote, they've made it very clear? Who Like, who are you saying it to? Yeah. Management? Ownership? You're, you're not winning. 11, 8, and 3 in your last 22. That's okay. That's the standard? You, you, you've, you've declared? You've, you've confirmed? Where are the guys? 11, 8, and 3. Really? That's what's happening? Keep it coming. 650, 650. Mike McKenna, former NHL goalie and NHL analyst with Daily Faceoff, joins us next. We'll pitch this by him as well on the way here on the People's Show, home of the Canucks, Sportsnet 650. Welcome back to the show, this people. Is the people show. This is the People Show on the official home of the Canucks, Sportsnet 650. Here's Bit Nazar and Randy Janda. Back to back days with that one. Again, the, the bed had been going on for so long that I thought uh, the big voice guy had already talked. Pause for dramatic effect. I suppose. I wonder I suppose. if the streak continues tomorrow. My bad. <laughs> My bad. It's the life we chose. Yeah. This media game. So, should get traded for that failure. Uh, you might. <laughs> Bick Nazar and Randy Jandy here on The People Show. We'll talk to Mike McKenna in just a couple of minutes. New lines today as well uh, over at uh, Canucks practice as they gear up for the New York Islanders tomorrow. Uh, Phil DiGiuseppe finally uh, got... Uh, Rotated in, playing alongside Elias Pettersson and Connor Garland. He was rotating with Nils Hoaglander. Uh, JT Miller was with Tanner Pearson and Brock Besser. Lamico Highmore Mott stick stuck together. And then Alex Chason uh, got the key spot next to Bo Horvat and Vasily Pudkold. And I got to admit, I kind of like the, the look of that line. We, we've gotten into this conversation of, like, what wingers Bo Horvat needs. And, mm-hmm. look, we've seen skill guys go with it. We've seen defensive guys go with it. I, I kind of go back to, just, like, if you get grinders. Yeah, there's uh, this idea that, hey, you know, Bo Horvat, you got to put him next to elite wingers. As we've seen, it doesn't necessarily translate. So, you know, one of his best years, one of the, the best years that Antoine Roussel had was playing next to Bo Horvat, right? It was a 26-point season for Antoine Roussel. And a little bit of playmaking. Pod Colson's got that in his game, where Bo is a shoot first center. Put him next to a player like that. Chase on. Can you find yourself in the soft areas? Can you get a shot off? Maybe, you know, can you really hack in one of those rebounds? And like, that's mm-hmm. his game. That's how he's going to score. It's that other pairing with Pod Colson and Horvat that you look at and say, all right, two big bodies. One can play make, the other is a shoot first center. Maybe there's some results there. Uh, for me, it's about PDG, though. DiGiuseppe is the one where bigger body, even when he played 31 games last year, his hits per 60 was 13.6, which was top 20 in the league when he was playing. So I like him as a part of that. Obviously, that means Hoaglander would be out of the lineup, but I think you got to switch it up here based on what we've seen from Hoaglander. Uh, We'll talk to uh, Mike McKenna now, former NHL goalie and daily face-off NHL analyst at Mike McKenna 56. Mike, how are you? I am doing good today, enjoying a nice 80 degree weather day here in St. Louis. How Stellar. are you guys doing? Oh no, we're doing great. We're doing great. We're we're taking a bit of heat right now in the uh, 
text message inbox. Uh, Oh, boy. So earlier today, (laughs) in uh, 32 Thoughts, I don't know if you've read it, I'll read the thought out to you. Uh, from Elliot Friedman, said, Vancouver players are sick of the rumors, not that I blame them. They've made it very clear. And I was kind of making the point off the top of the show that they haven't necessarily established some long credibility of winning here. It's been, you know, they've been 24th in win in point percentage over the course of the past four or five years. They're, you know... Eighth in points percentage since Boudreaux arrived, but 11, 8, and 3 in the calendar year once that coach bump was kind of removed. It, it, it's been, you know, 500-ish hockey, and I'm surprised that there's frustrations over being in the rumor mill when the fundamental requirement is to win games and it doesn't happen. Being a professional, when you're not winning and trade rumors are a plenty, do you as a professional accept that and understand that that's part of the game? You have to. You know, if you sign up for this job thinking you're going to play in one place your whole career, bunnies and rainbows, everything goes smoothly, you're just, you're wrong, man. It's not going to happen. And dealing with the rumors, dealing with all the innuendo that goes along with it is just par for the course. And, you know, when you get older in your career, you learn how to handle it, that you just dismiss it. Like, if it happens, it happens. You really are resigned to the fact that it's totally out of your control. You know, all you can do is play your best. The frustrating part is when you're on a poor team that like, and, and I wouldn't even call Vancouver poor right now. You know, Vancouver's actually got a chance here at at least pushing to make playoffs. Okay. It's still a trudge though, because you're looking at those standings thinking, man, we've got to be near perfect to get ourselves in. And then you factor in people talking about trades and you're going, man, like, can we just play here? We just want to play. And that's where you've got to be able to tune the media out because no matter what, it's in the back of your head, especially for players that are about midway through their career or so, their contracts, whether they have a year or two left on them, whether they're RFA, UFA, it all comes into play. About the only ones that ever feel safe are your entry-level players. But guess who ends up getting tossed into trades pretty often? <laughs> it's the entry-level guys. So, you know, you, you just learn how to deal it as you deal with it as you get older in your career. And like I say, it's just this sense that, hey, man, it's out of my control. All I can do is go play. But you also want the – you want things to just be quiet so you can just focus on the task at hand. Uh, this Canucks team is not that. But back in 2018, 2019, you played on a Flyers team that was really perplexing to me where they had all the talent. But that, you know, maturity in their game maybe, you know, just – crumbling in certain moments. It, it was a star-sided team, Mike, but you guys couldn't really necessarily figure it out. I know uh, with Dave Haxtell earlier on in the year, uh, how do you become a mature team? Like, what happens in that moment you can't necessarily react? I, I remember that Philly team getting blank 6 nothing on back-to-back weekends in Hockey Night in Canada. Like, how do, you, how do you change that mindset? Well, maturity comes with experience, but experience isn't always necessarily at the NHL level, as crazy as that sounds. And, you know, you can have players that come out of college hockey that are very mature, very prepared, and you hear that a lot. And, of course, me coming from the college hockey background, I have a bit of a bias there, but I tend to think that you do get a more mature player at that stage that's had, you know, more things to worry about in life. They've had more responsibilities on their plate. They've had school. They've had other things. And and I'm not just throwing this at the feet of junior hockey or European hockey, but a lot of the players that come out at 20 years old, 18 years old, that's all they've done is hockey. That's it. That's been their life. That's been everything. And, you know, you really have to learn on the fly what maturity means at the NHL level, uh, even at the pro level. And I I think it helps having players who have come through an organization um, that have been through it, that have been through even a coaching change previously. Without that, without the experience of upheaval in your franchise, Sometimes you just don't know what that's like and how to handle it, whether it's a general manager, whether it's a head coach. If it's been the same person all the time and that's what you've been used to and comfortable with, it's much harder to process change than it is when you've dealt with it a couple of times previously. So, I mean, I think you can build that before you get to the pro, before you get to the NHL. But really, until you go through those moments of adversity, you're not going to know what it's like and how to react in the moment. And it's always difficult to do so when it's your first time through it. Where is it toughest when, when a room is dealing with the rumors? Is, is it uh, specifically on the team? Is it on the players' families? Where did you find it, it was always toughest? It's, you know, I think it's a little bit of everything. The families are – it can vary for everyone, right? But, like, 
I was always nervous at trade deadline, even with my career being a depth goaltender. I kept waiting and thinking it was going to happen. And I remember the one time I was traded at the trade deadline um, from the Springfield Thunderbirds, which was the Florida Panthers organization over to Tampa Bay's organization to head to the Syracuse Crunch. I didn't get the phone call until an hour after trade deadline. I had no clue. So I thought I was scot-free. I was in the clear. You know, my wife and I were ready to make dinner that night. Everything was good. And so, I mean, I was I was beside myself when I got dealt then. I don't think it factors in, you know, to a young family as much as to a family who's really rooted. And at the NHL level, you know, you get families that live in a city for five, six, seven, eight years, and that's your life. That's your friend set. That's really difficult. And it definitely gets your nervousness up. Um, again, when you've been somewhere for a while, I think it's kind of equal between the player and the family that you know it may come and you just hope it doesn't. Um, but yeah, it's it's real because it happens. We see it. Very rarely does anyone ever spend a whole career in one city. Yeah, I remember uh, talking to Yannick Anson after he got traded to San Jose and he went to a contender. He went to a team that should have been you know, fighting for uh, a deep playoff spot. And I've never heard somebody, a player, more not into it like it was kind of you know you could Mm -hmm. tell that it was wearing on him from a family perspective as well and he admitted that and that's that's a real thing Mm -hmm. you know like there's a real mental fatigue to it like you described you can be on a great team but you still have to find your mental juice to go out there and perform and that's not always easy if you just left a family behind like that you need to make sure you're going to go you if you're trading for a player you want them to be engaged you want them to be happy that's something that general managers sometimes don't take into account that they should you're listening to The People Show. We're joined by Mike McKenna. And Mike, uh, it was it was kind of painful to watch Yaroslav Halak the other night where, you know, this is a night where Thatcher Demko's getting his rest or supposed to get his rest, and Yaro hasn't been playing many games this year. And just seeing him, especially in that second period where you can tell that confidence isn't there, he's kind of looking towards the bench. When you saw that mm. and you saw the fallout, um, what did you think as a fellow goalie? Well, I mean, I, I've been in Yarrow's shoes before, in his skates, I should say, where it just feels like nothing's going right and you can't grab a win. Uh, you just want to go in and be able to give your goalie partner a strong performance so that Demko can have a seat. Uh, the big thing for me, though, with Halak is that I, I just don't see the fire there right now. It's almost like he's given up on the season from an optics point, okay? And if I said that you know, face-to-face to anybody, I'm sure they'd take exception with it, but I'm just going on what I can see. And there's structural things that I, that bother me about Halak's game right now. You know, I, he's he's relying on paddle down occasionally when he shouldn't be. He's also not uh, being patient on his edges, which is something he'd been good at previously in his career. He's down early. He's not finding pucks. Like to me, it just looks like he's kind of bored with the season or almost over it. And, you know, you hate to throw that at the feet of a contract, but when you've got a no-move clause and you're locked into a place – and you're late in your career, I don't know what his mindset is, but maybe he's thinking this is my last season right now and uh, I'm just going to get through it. And that's not what you need. You know, there, there you need a hunger there to be able to perform. And it's going to be tough because right now, Halak's had a really tough stretch here, like really tough. And these last three games have blown his stats up. Um, but you need wins and you need to be able to play. You can't rely on Demko for every single game. You can ride him hot. But it can't be all the time. And I think part of it for Locke is he hasn't played as much. Like, he played a lot in Boston when he was teamed with Tuka Rask, 30, 40 games a year. That has not been the case here in Vancouver. Uh, and I think that that's been a, a tough transition for him. They're in such a delicate part of the schedule right now because the, all these games are so important. They're making this playoff push. And you mentioned it. It's like, hey, you want to give your your starter, your, your your partner there, a little bit of rest. We were talking about this yesterday. For the rest of this month, how many games realistically would you give Thatcher Demko? And just kind of highlight this for you because I don't know if you've seen the schedule. They have a back-to-back after the trade deadline on the 23rd and the 24th. And, you know, that's really about it as far as back-to-backs. They they play Minnesota. Or sorry, they have two back-to-backs. Calgary versus Buffalo mm-hmm. before the deadline. And then uh, Minnesota and Colorado, those two that I mentioned. Do you play yeah. well, Demko think- in, in all but one? Well, I, you're going to have to ride Demko. I mean, again, this yeah, all the playoff hopes of Vancouver Canucks hinge on Thatcher Demko at this point for me and the way he's played this season. Um, 
I, I can't see playing Halak more than probably three times over the course of this month. You know, I look in about two weeks here. There's probably a good window. If you want to give Halak a start against the Devils on the 15th, that probably makes sense. You know Halak's probably going to play against Buffalo on the 20th because Demko's getting Calgary 100% on the 19th. He has to go in that game. But, man, even the 23rd and 4th, if you're really fighting for a spot and you're starting to get down to it, Colorado, Minnesota, it's back-to-backs on the road. There's no way Demko can play both of those. I mean, he could. You could try. But that's a lot of travel. Uh, so I, I think Halak's definitely set to get two more starts this month, and I would probably on the 15th give him that start against the Devils. But other than that, I think you sit Thatcher Demko down and you say, listen, we know this is going to be tough. We know if we make playoffs, it's going to be hard on you. But that's what it's about right now is giving us a chance, and we're going to ride you. And so, you know, if you're Halak, you got to do it in practice because you can't play your way out of things. It's just the reality of it, and he's going to have to go to work every day when he steps onto the ice, whether he's starting or not. You're listening to The People Show. We're joined by Mike McKenna. You can uh, catch his work at Daily Faceoff, of course, an NHL analyst. And, uh, Mike, this past Saturday, uh, working this game for Hockey Night Canada up in Jobby, 10-7, Detroit <laughs> puts up a seven spot, Toronto gets 10 <laughs> goals. Uh, you described about almost scoring a goal last week to us and told us the story. Have you ever been in a game like that where, you know, 16, 17 goals were going in? Uh, I was in a game with the Ottawa Senators, in 2018-19, I think we lost 9-3 to to the Buffalo Sabres, of all people. Um, I <laughs> It was a back-to-back, mind you, and we were playing Buffalo the first night, Tampa Bay the second night, and I was not starting against Buffalo, which shocked me because Tampa was really good, and I thought, oh, man, I'm, I might get the Tampa start. That'll be fun. And so Craig Anderson goes in. He allows three in the first and I go in for the second period, maybe even midway through the first. I can't remember. And I allowed six. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> I remember thinking, like, this cannot get to double digits. This needs to end now. And I just couldn't get in front of anything. And it was the first games I'd played in the NHL in a while. I think it might have been the first one of the year. And, man, it just went poorly. But, I mean, think about it. That was only 12 goals or 10 goals or 11 goals. 17 goals in a game. Like, Man, they couldn't even build the highlight pack out long enough. When you go to NHL.com, typically that's like a 10-minute condensed game. And that one, you they almost had to tack on an extra five minutes. Um, it wasn't enviable from a goalie's position. I'm sure it was entertaining for fans. But my takeaway is there's no way Sheldon Keefe walked in that locker room afterwards and was happy with his team, even after even if they won. 10-7, you can't play. You got to be better defensively. You can't let that happen. So entertaining for the fans. That's a tough one for the players. Well, even yesterday, 8-4, right? 5-3, uh, mm-hmm. 7 um, nothing the day before. Boston, obviously 7-2, New Jersey and, and Vancouver. Scoring across the league right now is as high as it's been in some time, basically since the first year out of the lockout. What do you uh, chalk that up to? Well, the simple answer for me is that the skill level is higher than it's ever been. I think that's true. Um, it's unqu- It's You can't argue that. But the underlying factor is that there have been a lot of young players in the NHL this year. They've made their debuts. The, the goaltending has been third, fourth, fifth on the depth charts at some, in some occasions. So I don't think you're seeing the level of goaltending we have previously with injuries, what we had with COVID earlier this year. And teams aren't getting to practice a lot. You know, every, you're going to get a lot of time off. Well, that hasn't happened now that the uh, Olympic window's out the window. So I, I think that the lack of practice, the youth of the league, the depth of goaltending, that's all factored in uh, that it's just been a little bit more of a chaotic game than we've been used to because you haven't had the the old guard, all the old relics to trot out there that knew how to <laughs> clamp the game down when they had to, and they didn't have the skill to do it in the first place. Now you got kids with plenty of energy, plenty of skill. They just don't know how to play defense in the NHL just yet. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday about, you know, there's certain teams that you expect to be near the top of the rankings, but they're kind of dropping a little bit. Washington, maybe a Vegas, depending on what they've had to go through. Is there a one team that you're nervous about right now saying, wait a second, I expected them to be much better and, and they're slamming the brakes pretty early here? Yeah, well, I mean, Edmonton always factors into that. I don't know whether they're going to make playoffs or not. I can't believe in that team until they solidify their goaltending and their defensive structure. But uh, I think Minnesota will be fine. They've hit a lull. They had one previously this year. They always seem to bounce back. The Capitals, 
I mean, Vanacek is now back in their lineup, and that helps because Samsonov hasn't been able to do what's necessary for that club. The team I am concerned about is Vegas, and it's not missing playoffs. I think Vegas is going to make playoffs. I, I don't think that that's really a question at this stage of the game. They're just missing so many bodies. Pacioretty's out. Stone's out. Uh, Alec Martinez is out. They're missing a lot, and they haven't found a combo to go with Jack Eichel yet, especially on the power play. So my concern about Vegas is that they may get to the first round and flame out if they don't have the skill necessary. Even against a team like Los Angeles, I could see that happening, and Los Angeles is on the rise. So my concern is definitely in Vegas. Most of it is is injury-oriented, um, but I do think there's concerns beyond that. Teams are clued in on how to play them. Even last night, San Jose Sharks, were they were awful, but they clogged up the middle of the ice, and it was 1-1 midway through the game. Like They almost made a game out of it. So uh, Vegas is the one I think to keep an eye on. Like I say, I think they make playoffs. I'm just not sure how they do if they can't field a proper roster. Uh, he is Mike McKenna, former NHL goalie and uh, NHL analyst at dailyfaceoff.com. And uh, you can follow him at Mike McKenna56. Uh, always appreciate it. We'll talk next week. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on, as always. That's the great Mike McKenna. I love story time with Mike. Last week, we brought up a good story where he, he scored a goal. <laughs> this week, it was one where he allowed six goals in uh, a short period of time. So hey, we got to ask him the questions. But I did notice the details on the scoring the goal were a lot sharper than yeah. the details on this one. So maybe it was my first game. I don't know exactly when I came in. He knew exactly oh, yeah. how it went down when he scored the goal, which, there was I, like, which I understand. There was like a second-by-second second breakdown of what happened and what he was feeling. This one, uh, I can, yeah. The puck was fluttering towards me. I, I gloved it, put it down. It was, it was Got my hand on top of the stick. Uh, Mike's always great, but especially that question we asked him last week. You can catch it on the podcast from uh, last week. There was a, a giddiness to his answer right off the bat. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember. I remember every second. That's good stuff. That is good stuff uh, from Mike. Uh, again, you can go, if you missed it, uh, go check it out at the start. Uh, once hour one of this podcast gets posted on Spotify, Apple, or Google, wherever it gets you your podcast from. A lot more to come throughout the course of the show. We still will have trivia for you as well. Your chance to get a pair of tickets to the Canucks and Capitals on March 11th. Uh, and also, we'll talk about OEL and Myers. As much as we talked about Halak last game, we've talked about culture. Hey, a couple of guys that made turnovers in that game were Oliver ekman Larson and Tyler Myers. And it feels like they avoided a lot of criticism here. And you know, not that we're going to launch criticism toward there, but it's more about the scope of where they are in their careers. Because when Oliver ekman Larson was brought here, one of the arguments was, okay, this is can be exciting because the first couple of years you'll get a solid player and then we'll worry about the back end of the, the player in a few years. Well, if this turns out to be a lost year, where are we right now with a player like Oliver ekman Larson, And more importantly, that pairing there with Tyler Myers. Yeah, that's an important question because I think we can all agree that OEL and some of the work that he's done this year has been really impressive at the same time, right? Eating a lot of minutes. Tyler Myers, we were talking about a comeback season. Maybe, what, a couple of weeks ago, especially when they were on that hot streak, the original Boudreaux bump. But when you're looking at this long term, when we're talking about a retool, how do these guys fit in not only next year, but the year after that? Like, that to me is a pretty key question here is, okay, how are you looking at the long term view and these defensemen fitting into that? Because if you're trying to get younger, if you're trying to add some younger players, maybe some more defensemen, no question, how do the, both of these guys feature? And also, in 32 Thoughts, a right-handed center's name was brought up. We'll uh, talk about that all on the way here on the home of the Canucks, Sportsnet 650.